Greetings, friends. We are doing a study of chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel, and it uh, has something very unique about it. Now, Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels. It's written by Mark, young Mark, who is a protege of the Apostle Peter. Peter calls him Mark, my son. So how would a young person like Mark get this information to write the gospel? So we could call this the gospel of Peter as passed down to Mark. Now being that Mark was younger, the youngest of the four gospel writers, and by the way, neither Mark nor Luke were part of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Matthew and John were, but two of the four biographies of the life of Christ were written by two men who were not disciples of Jesus directly. You know, disciples, yes, in the sense they were believers in Christ, but not a part of the twelve. Now, Mark, being the youngest of the four gospel writers, his is the shortest of the four gospels, 16 chapters. It's like everything is packed in, condensed in together, and it's like one fluid motion or rush from one incident or one parable or one miracle to the next, to the next, to the next. And in 16 short chapters, it's over. He doesn't uh, take any time with genealogies and things like that. So some of that will make sense. Now in Mark's Gospel chapter 1, and this is the title, eight times, what, eight times the word immediately is found. Well, in the English Old King James Version of the Bible, four times immediately and four times straightway, which is exactly the same thing. So eight times the word immediately or straightway is found. And I want to look at these eight very quickly. Now, the fact that from the time the Lord Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30 to the time he was crucified and then rose from the dead at around 33 and a half. So that's three and a half short years. It's all the time that the Lord Jesus had to accomplish everything that the Father wanted for him to do in ministry in his life on this earth. So he had no time to waste. Three and a half short years, that was it. And so you can see why this word immediately gains relevance. Now, as I travel the world, uh, let me give you just a couple things in a few countries where time uh, doesn't mean a lot. Doesn't mean a lot. In India, the national time is Indian Standard Time, IST. But in reality, all the locals call it Indian Stretchable Time. Because they don't usually keep very good time here. Indian Stretchable Time. In the Philippines, their international airline is called Philippine Airlines, P-A-L. And the locals in the Philippines, it's a national joke. They call it, they say P-A-L stands for Plain Always Late. In the beautiful Fiji Islands, when they say I'm on Fiji time, it means absolutely nothing. It's a national joke. You can actually go to the souvenir shops in Fiji and buy t-shirts that have printed on them, I'm on Fiji time. That's a joke. Now, Fiji is the only country on earth where I've heard something like this. Brace yourselves for it. They said, Pastor Andrew, when the Lord comes back to rapture the bride, he'll have to make a second trip just for the Fijian believers because they won't be ready. Of course, it's a joke, but worth laughing about. Now, the point is, eight times. In one chapter of Mark's Gospel, the word immediately or straightway appears because the Lord Jesus had no time to waste. Let's look at the first of the eight, verses 9, 10, and 11. It came to pass in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, John 
didn't want to baptize Jesus in water. Jesus says, John, do it. I need to fulfill all righteousness. Think about it. John the baptism baptizing John the Baptist baptizing people in water. His was a baptism for repentance. Repentance for what? From sin. Therefore, the only person who did not need to be baptized by John the Baptist in water was the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is the only sinless, perfect, holy, pure, chaste one to ever walk the earth. Well, Adam and Eve were till they sinned. So the only one who didn't need to be water baptized was the Lord Jesus. So the question uh, I've been asked, so why did Jesus go to be baptized in water? He tells John, John, just do it because I need to fulfill all righteousness. I would like to submit a thought here. During his earthly ministry, a lady came with a bottle of very expensive pikenard ointment or perfume. She broke it poured it on Jesus on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And those present among the religious leaders and some disciples were indignant, thinking that cost a lot of money. It could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Very right, self-righteous. The money could have been given to the poor. And Jesus said to them, Let her be. She has come before hand to anoint my body to its burial. She's come in advance to anoint my body for its burial. So now, back to water baptism. Jesus is the only perfect, pure, holy one who doesn't need to be baptized in water. So why does he come to John? His action by coming for water baptism was saying to Abba Father, Yes, Father, I will do everything you require and ask of me. And when the time comes in Gethsemane, I will drink that cup. I will become sin. I will take on the sin of the whole world. And before time, in advance, I'm coming to get baptized in water. And the Father rends the heavens, splits the heavens, and his voice says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descends on the Lord Jesus in bodily form as a dove. What, what uh, an incident. Phenomenal. It would have stunned every person watching. Now hear this. What would you and I do if we saw such an incredible occurrence in front of our eyes? We would say, this is God's man of the hour. Pitch a huge tent, mega tent, and hold a crusade to hear God's man of the hour. Hear me, friends. When I hear or used to hear, because I've stopped watching television altogether for a couple of years now. When I used to hear, they would have a big crusade or a big meeting or whatever. And then they would announce, and now we have God's man of the hour. I used to cringe in my heart. Hear me, dear friend. The only person who was, is, and will be God's man of the hour is our Lord Jesus Christ. No human, male or female, is worthy of such a title or accolade. Now, watch this. After he's baptized in water, immediately, when he comes up out of the baptism, immediately the Holy Ghost descends on him in bodily form as a dove. That's the first immediately. He comes out of the water and watch the second one, verses 12 and 13. Second, and immediately... The Spirit drives him into the wilderness. He was there forty days, tempted of Satan with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. So no big crusade. Are you watching God's pattern, plan, and design here, as opposed to man's pattern and uh, corporate planning? Immediately after this phenomenal event, he is driven into the wilderness by the Spirit of God. 
Instead of a huge crusade, he's taken to a quiet place alone with God. And he's tempted by Satan, etc. So please hear that. And by the way, he's driven by the Spirit. Some people, we almost need to drive them to come to church. To come for corporate fellowship or worship or a time of prayer. And you know, as far as witnessing to the lost, there are some Christians who say, but you know, Pastor, I need to be led by the Spirit. Because in the book of Romans we read, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So I need to be led to witness to people. I'm just quoting another preacher, but it's worth considering. Here's how he put it. For believers using scripture as an excuse not to testify about Christ and saying we need to be led by the Spirit. He said, excuse me, what they need is not to be led by the Spirit, but a lead pipe across the backs. Now, 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 I'm just quoting him. It's obviously not to be taken literally, but you get what? we are saying. How can I as a child of God use scripture as an alibi as, or as an excuse not to share Jesus with others? Jesus was driven by the Spirit in the wilderness. We need to be driven with a, with a heart for lost souls to testify for Christ. He goes into the wilderness the second immediately and the word says he was tempted of Satan. We know about the temptations was with the wild beasts, yes, and the angels ministered unto him. Please hear me touch on angels a little bit. Satan tempted him, and the angels ministered unto him. You listen to so many Christians talking. Oh, the devil did this, the devil did that, the enemy is attacking me, Satan is buffeting me. First of all, there's only one devil, my friend, and there's one God. The difference is God is ubiquitous. He is present everywhere at the same time. Lucifer, Satan, the devil, is only able to be in one place at one time. He's a localized being. But he has demons to do his bidding, his cohorts. God has his angels. Lucifer has his demons. But in the wilderness it says, the angels ministered to Jesus. But when we listen to Christians, so much of their conversation is about the devil or what the demons are doing. Now listen closely. Again, the angels minister to Jesus. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, we read that when the dragon, and Bible scholars take that to mean Lucifer, was cast out from heaven in time past, with his tail he drew or he took one-third of the stars of heaven with him. Again, Bible scholars, commentaries, pretty much in agreement that that's refer, referring to when Lucifer was cast out of the presence of God, one third of the created angels rebelled with Lucifer and they are now called fallen angels or demons. Now basic fifth grade mathematics class. If one third of the angels fell with Lucifer, they are now bad or fallen angels or demons. How many thirds are still good angels with God? That's right. Two thirds. That means for every one demon, there are how many angels? At least two angels. We don't know how many millions, billions, quadrillions of angels God created, but for every one angel, demon, there's a minimum of two angels. Something more stunning. How many angels' names or archangels' names are given in the Bible? You know, there's only three names given. Michael, the warrior angel. Gabriel, the messenger angel. And Lucifer, who's the fallen angel. Out of those three, one is fallen, two are one is fallen, two are good. So, to conclude my little point on angels, I release you as a fellow Christian to talk as much as you wish about Lucifer, Satan, the devil, and his demons, so long as 
you talk twice as much about the Lord Jesus Christ and the angels of God. The Bible says, give no place to the devil. Friend, what are you going to do? What are we going to do when we get to heaven? There's no devil to shout at. There's no devil to blame. He says, so what am I supposed to do, Pastor Andrew? Worship and praise and bless the name of Jesus. That's how you give no place to the devil. So the second immediately, he was driven in the wilderness. The third, verses 16, 17, and 18. Now as Jesus walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And verse 18, and straightway or immediately Simon and Andrew forsook their nets and followed Jesus. That's the straight third immediately. Simon and Andrew were with their nets and Jesus calls them, casting their net in the sea. See, the net uh, symbolizes our connections in this world. Starts with family, cousins, friends, social acquaintances, people at work, uh, in the neighborhood. And so we feel like we can hardly move. I'm set in my place. But what uh, Simon and Andrew, Simon who is Simon Peter, they immediately left those nets. Don't let your social connections keep you from Jesus Christ. And you know what else Jesus said to them? Come after me and I will make you fishes of men. All you're catching, gentlemen, is fish. Follow me and you will net men and women, the souls of people for the kingdom of God. I love the words of the Lord Jesus. Even if we truncate his sentence in half, it's still so powerful. Watch this. Jesus said, come unto me and I will make you fishes of men. Watch this now. Come unto me and I will make you truncate that. If you and I leave the world behind and chase after Jesus, become God chasers, he will make us to conform into his image, which then will cause us to bring souls into his kingdom. So the third immediately is he calls uh, Simon Peter and Andrew in verse 18 says, immediately straightway they forsook their nets. Drop what is holding you back from fulfilling God's call on your life, my friend. The fourth, verses 19 and 20. And when he'd gone a little farther thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also on the ship mending their nets. And straightway, immediately, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went out. To him, I like that last phrase. James and John, sons of thunder, sons of Zebedee, Jesus sees them. It says, straightway, immediately he called them. I want to focus on what they left behind. Andrew and Peter, Simon Peter, needed to drop their net. We understand what that means, the worldly connections. James and John were in their father's boat. It wasn't a little raft or canoe, I'll prove it to you. It had hired servants. So basically, there was their father. They left their father, the hired servants, and the boat. This is a big boat. That's the family business that they would inherit. And hired servants? Allow me to give you an example. Especially in the West, some of us may not be able to fully appreciate this. I grew up in India, and our uh, our status changed a little bit for the better once we grew up and started working. So when I, I got my job at 19, started to contribute towards the family expenses. So around 20, 21, I got my motorcycle. Here's how I used to get woken up in the morning. In a developing country, those in the West eat your heart out. I'd be sleeping in the morning. We had two maids, one to clean house and one to cook. In the morning, the one maid would come with my cup of hot tea to my bedside, the coffee table there. Sir, your tea, sir. 
I would just kind of groan. Yeah. She'd let it down there, go away. I'd roll over in bed, start sipping the hot tea. It would wake me up, finish the tea, leave the empty cup on that coffee table, leave my bed unmade, go to the restroom, get ready for the day and for work. By the time I returned to my room to get dressed for the day, the empty cup of tea and the saucer is taken, my bed is made, I get dressed, put on my suit, whatever I wore, suit and boots, went to the dining table, my breakfast is prepared, hot and fresh, with a hot cup of Horlicks or Ovaltine, whatever name might ring a bell for you. I would have my food, thank my mum, I didn't acknowledge the servant, the maid, the hired servants, like James and John, I thank my mum, went to my motorcycle, boom, started and rode off to work. I came to America, I've got to start the lawnmower. I've got to push it by myself. <laughs> I've got to spray the weeds. We've got to vacuum the carpet. you got to do everything yourself. James and John left their father, the hired servants. Now you know what we're talking about. And the boat, which was their future inheritance. They left everything immediately to follow the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not telling you you got to leave your parents and your wife and, or your husband and your children. You hear what I'm saying. But what obedience to the call of God on their lives. Verse 21. This is the fifth immediately. And they went to Capernaum and straightway, immediately, on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and taught. On the Sabbath day, which is the day of the week they used to worship, where did you find the Lord Jesus? In the synagogue. On the Lord's day, we generally worship the first day of the week. Where should we be found? In corporate fellowship with the saints. We know that that's not the house of God. This is the temple of God. But to come together corporately to praise and worship and glorify the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Hebrews, uh, I believe it's, um, Hebrew, in Hebrews we read uh, 10.25, chapter 10, verse 25. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. In other words, seize the opportunities we have, whether it's a house fellowship, whether it's a local church, whatever. Seize those opportunities to come together in corporate prayer, praise, worship, and preaching and teaching of the word. Where was Jesus on, on the Sabbath? In the synagogue. I, I kiddingly say this. Many Christians, I'll tell you the name of their favorite church on Sunday morning. Are you ready? It's called Bedside Baptist Church. It's, what are we doing? There's another favorite one that many Christians like on Sunday morning. Church of St. Mattress. Church of... Of Saint Mattress. Now another powerful scripture, Revelation chapter one verse ten. John the apostle is exiled on the island of Patmos. There's no local fellowship to go to on Sunday morning. He's alone by himself, like not exactly marooned, but exiled. He has no calendar like we do. I don't know how he's marking off the days of the week in exile. And you know what he says at the age of ninety? plus years of age and exile on an island? He says in John, Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. We can't even get off our mattresses. I do love you. <laughs> we find it hard to wake up on a Sunday to go and fellowship together with the saints. The sixth, immediately, Verses 27 uh, and 28. Actually, this starts from verse 23. There was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit or a demon. He cried out, or the demon and the man cries out, saying, Let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold your peace. Keep quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn the man and cried with a loud voice, it came out of him. Verse 27, 
And they were all amazed. But they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine? With authority he commands, and even unclean spirits obey him. And immediately, that's the sixth immediately, immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. The wonderful thing is, demons, demons from the pits, of hell recognize that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God and yet there are human beings caught up in their pride who refuse to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God. I appeal to you friends if you don't know him as your Savior and Lord, if you won't listen to me as a Bible teacher and preacher, hear what a demon from the pits of hell said. Demons call him the Holy One of God. Would you not hearken to that and admit it now, here in this life, before it's too late? And after he casts out the demon, they are so amazed. It says, immediately, his fame spread abroad. Dear friend, don't seek what Shakespeare in his seven ages of men or seven stages of men calls the bubble reputation. We work so hard to get promotions and rise to the top, so to speak. Get a top dog CEO position and good money and be respected by the subordinates and then we die. It's the bubble reputation. One writer said, Only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. No matter what our personal accomplishments, all of it will be gone into dust and ashes. Only what we do for the Lord Jesus Christ will live on through into eternity. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout the region. Then we come to the seventh immediately. Verses 29 through 31. And forthwith when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon, Peter, and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a fever, and they tell him. And he came and took her by the hand. And lifted her up. And immediately, that's number seven, immediately the fever left her. And she ministered unto him, unto them. Ministered there means, she said, don't leave. I need to get you some snacks, prepare some sandwiches, a cup of coffee, whatever. She ministered. She was not only raised up from her sick bed, the fever was gone. She was able to prepare something for them to snack on or have a bite. But the point is this. In the seventh, immediately. Who was sick? Simon Peter's mother-in-law. The Vatican claims and proclaims that the first ever Pope was Simon Peter. Simon Peter in Mark's Gospel chapter 1 verse 30 had a mother-in-law, his wife's mother, his mother-in-law, which means he had a wife. So the first pope I'm happy to share with you was a married man. So as a preacher of the gospel, I want to also share with you that I am now have been following the advice and the, the model of the first pope. He had a wife and so do I. I just thought I'd make that point straight from the Holy Scriptures. Another point I would like to make on this. They come and tell Jesus, Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. I already read the Scriptures. Can you remember and tell me how many words the Lord Jesus Christ prayed over her for her to get well? The answer is zero. 
He didn't even speak a single word. The scripture says rather he came up to the bedside, took her by the hand, just held her hand. And immediately, immediately, that's the seventh immediately in this chapter, the fever left her, praise God. And yet sometimes we feel like just praying is not enough. I need to raise my voice so many decibels. I need to yell and shout out. I need to have my fist flailing in the air so that God will hear me. Jesus spent entire nights alone praying to his father. He didn't even have to speak a word. Wow! That's the Jesus I worship, and I'm sure you worship too. Isn't that so awesome? So that's the seventh immediately, which is a clear example of physical healing by the great physician. Now we come to the eighth and final me immediately in Mark chapter 1. It's from verses 40 all the way to the end, verse 45. I need to read this and then we'll go through this final immediately. There came a leper to Jesus, beseeching, imploring, begging, and kneeling down to him, saying, If you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said, I will be thou clean. And as soon as Jesus had spoken, immediately, that's number eight of eight, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged the leper and sent him away. Now watch the last two verses. This is what I call the fine print. Most of us don't care to read the fine print in a contract. But this fine print is from the lips of the Lord Jesus himself. Would you follow this with me? Then I'll go back to the last immediately. 44 and 45, the last two verses of chapter 1 of Mark's gospel. Jesus said to him, See you say nothing to any man, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, offer for your cleansing the things which Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But he went out and began to publish it and blaze it abroad so that Jesus could no more openly enter the city but was out in the desert places and they came to him from every quarter. Verse 44 is the fine print. This man had evidently, obviously, had a miracle. The leprosy was gone. The Lord Jesus saw it. The disciples saw it. Others in the vicinity in the synagogue saw it. But Jesus still said, keep quiet. Please hear me, believer. This is the Lord Jesus himself. You cannot contest this with me. Jesus said to the leper who was cleansed, Be silent. Go to the priest according to the law of Moses. Get yourself checked out. And when the priest gives you a certificate of cleansing, then maybe you can talk about it. How does that apply in today's world? We have people, and dare I say it, faith healers and others, making tall claims. On stages, please, I hope you remain my friend. This is the word of God. And sometimes in churches, it's, they, they do something. What I'm not getting into details. And then they start, they say, this person had a heart problem. Uh, 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 and this purple person had diabetes. And, and now God has healed them. You know what we should be doing? Follow Jesus. Dear brother, dear sister. Go to your doctor. Go back to the hospital. Get another CAT scan or an X-ray. Whatever it was. Blood work done. And then most likely it's an unsaved non-Christian doctor. They will say, sir or ma'am, I can't explain this. Your heart is just amazing. It's, 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 it's normal. There's no cancer there now. It's a miracle. Then you come back next Sunday to church with that x-ray, with that CAT scan, whatever, lab report, and let's bring the roof down. Can we follow the example that Jesus, our Lord, laid down in his holy scriptures? Now, exception. If there's a genuine, bona fide person in a wheelchair or someone who's physically blind, Something very obvious, or the man with the withered hand that we've known for years, if something like that happened.
happens in front of your eyes in church or at the crusade, well, if it's bona fide, you don't have to wait to praise God. But if it's something internal that needs to be double-checked and verified, please follow the fine print given by our Lord Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 44. Now we've taken care of the fine print. Let's deal with the last eighth of eight immediately. The leper came to Jesus, beseeching, begging, and kneeling down. What's that attitude compared to some modern day Christians who make them mans of God? Please, again, I don't want to lose friends. Come back to the Bible. This is right in front of the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. The way some believers talk to God, it's like, this is what you said and you better would do it. Excuse me, who's God here? He is God. We are not and never will be. And what's the man's posture? He was kneeling. This apparently in the modern churches around the world has become a forgotten and a lost art. While I must give credit, the Roman Catholics and some of the traditional denominations like uh, Anglican Church, maybe Church of England, they probably still do some kneeling, but a lot of them have beautiful, comf comfortable, padded kneelers. So it takes no energy or effort. This leper was on the ground, on the, in the synagogue, on the floor. I'm pretty sure they weren't carpeted. Begging, imploring, and kneeling in complete submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he ask for? Saying to Jesus, If you will, you can make me clean. Please look at that sentence closely. The second half, you can make me clean. This leper never ever for a split second doubted that the Lord Jesus had the power and the ability to make him clean and whole. He never doubted that. He is stronger in his faith in that than many of us so-called Christians. What was he doubtful about? He said, if you will. In other words, I'm a leper. I am poor. I am wretched. I'm an outcast from society. Would you be willing to do it for someone like me? But he never doubted the power and ability of the Lord Jesus to make him clean. He said, you can. I know you can. And Jesus, the Bible says, was moved with compassion. Verse 41. Put forth his hand. Stretch. Imagine the finger of God, the hand of God, moving directly towards you to touch you. That's enough to freeze anybody in their space. He was moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him. I think it was Bill and Gloria Gaither who wrote that beautiful song, uh, Shackled by a Heavy Burden. I'm pretty sure their inspiration would have come from something like this. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened and now I know. He touched me and made me whole. Jesus put forth his hand, being moved with compassion, and touched the leper and said to the doubtful part of his question, If you will. And Jesus' answer was, I will. I will listen to me, my friend. If our precious Lord Jesus' answer is, I will for you to be healed, for you to be made whole, to a wretched, poor outcast of a leper. His answer is, I will. God is no respecter of persons. Will he or will he not touch and heal you? Will he or will he not touch and save you from your sin right now? Of course he wills. He's waiting, willing, and wanting for you to come and appeal to him. Lay it all at the foot of his cross. He says, I will be thou clean. Verse 42, as soon as Jesus had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him. Thank God 
Thank you, Jesus, and hallelujah. I trust you were blessed by these uh, eight immediately in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. Amen.